Friends, welcome to our digital worship service. We are so happy that you are joining us online as we worship our King. For those of you living on Molokai, you know that this has been kind of a crazy week. We had our first official case of COVID-19, and in many respects, it happened in the worst possible way it could have. Uh, the stormy winds of uncertainty and the gales of doubt and fear have been sweeping our island, our nation, and our world recently. In many ways, our society is unraveling in, in panic and in irrational anxiety at the current situation we're facing. Friends, I want to remind you of something this morning. We have a rock-solid hope. In Christ, we have a fortress of comfort to run to. If you know the God who created the universe, this Lord of hosts that we have been marveling at, you have no business being afraid of anything. One of the most common commands in scripture is do not be afraid. And that command is built and founded on the promises of God. We have massive, unshakable promises that are a refuge for us to run to in times of chaos and doubt. And just take one moment with me this morning and walk into one of the fortresses that God has given us to be a shelter and a refuge in times of trouble. Remember the unassailable castle of Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Friends, do you believe that? Do you take that seriously? Do you really believe that God is exhaustively sovereign over the coronavirus, governing every single bit of it for good? Does that have a practical impact on the way that you live your life and the way that you feel? All things. In many ways, that is one of the two or three greatest promises in all of Scripture, in my opinion. It is a fortress that contains within its walls almost every other promise that God has made to his people. I want to read you just a little quote of what John Piper says about this promise. This is spectacular. He writes, if you live inside this massive promise, your life is more solid and stable than Mount Everest. Nothing can blow you over when you are inside the walls of Romans 8.28. Outside Romans 8.28, all is confusion and anxiety and fear and uncertainty. Outside the promise of all-encompassing future grace, there are straw houses of drugs and pornography and dozens of futile diversions. There are slat walls and tin roofs of fragile investment strategies and fleeting insurance coverage and trivial retirement plans. There are cardboard fortifications of deadbolt locks and alarm systems. And we could add hand sanitizer, breathing masks, and social distancing. Outside are a thousand substitutes for Romans 8.28. But once you walk through the door of love into this massive, unshakable structure of Romans 8.28, everything changes. There come into your life stability and depth and freedom. You simply cannot be blown over anymore. The confidence that a sovereign God governs for your good all the pain and all the pleasure that you will ever experience is an incomparable refuge and security and hope and power in your life. When God's people really live by the future grace of Romans 8.28, from measles to the mortuary, they are the freest and strongest and most generous people in the world. Their light shines, and people give glory to their Father in heaven. Saints, in the face of all this uncertainty, we have a God who is a rock and a fortress. He protects all of us under the shadow of his sovereign wing. Don't forget who Christ is. He is the ocean of joy that we swim in. He is the mighty mountain of faithfulness that we stand on. Let us rejoice 
within the fortress of his grace this morning. And let's lift our voices and worship him, our King, our God, and our Lord. Precious Savior, we come before you this morning and we offer to you our worship. We love you, Lord. You are our fortress. You are our comfort. You are our treasure. You are the joy that we experience, Lord. We pray that this worship would be true, that it would be heartfelt, that it would be in accordance with the value and the worth of who you are. Hallow your name in this place this morning, I pray. Lord Jesus, we offer these things in your name. Amen.
Lord, we are reminded of Acts 17, 25. You give to all mankind life and breath and everything. And so you are worthy of our praise, Lord. And you alone are worthy of our praise. I pray this morning that as, as we come into your presence, as we dig into your word, uh, that we are just reminded of who you are, God. You are king of the universe, creator of everything. You are savior of souls. You are redeemer of your people. You are the sanctifier of your bride. And one day you will be the victorious one who comes and renews this earth, God. Help us to live in that hope. Help us to revel in that joy and Lord, I pray this morning that you would make yourself more real to us, that you would draw out our affections for you, and that you would give us new and deep and sweet knowledge of who you are this morning. We love you, and all of these things are done for the glory and the beauty of your name. Amen. So we have just a few announcements this morning. having several online services uh, over the course of the next week. Um, the first one is we're going to have a Good Friday service, and that is going to premiere at 7 p.m. on Friday. Uh, we invite everyone to join us in that. Um, we, we, uh, even in this time of craziness, we want to be taking the opportunity that we have to celebrate this season of Easter, which in many ways should be the highlight of the Christian year. And, and we don't want to miss th that, even in light of the situation that's going on. So 7 p.m. on Friday, we're going to be having a good Friday service. And then also, on not, at 9 a.m. on Easter morning on Sunday, we're going to be having an online Easter service. Uh, and, and because we can't get together uh, physically... Uh, we want to get together as much as possible online. And so in the same way that we would invite people to be a part of our big Easter service, normally we want you to be inviting people digitally. So on Facebook, Instagram, through text, however you can do it, invite people to join us for this Easter service at 9 a.m. on Sunday. There's going to be posters around the island we want to see as many people involved in this as possible. Our, our vision and our goal is that we would have 500 people logged in on our service that day. Not because Molokai Baptist is anything, but because our King and our Redeemer and our Savior deserves our praise. We also want to remind you that we have set up online giving. And we talked last week, we have, we have three ways to do that. Uh, the first is to log on to our website, molokaibaptist.com slash giving. Uh, very simple, takes less than 30 seconds. The second is to text the word GIVE to 808-793-5657. And that's Molokai Baptist's specific giving number. And then the third way is to go onto your app store, type in CHURCH. And find the app by Ministry One. Download the app and search for Molokai Baptist. And you can give through that app as well. And also, all of our sermons are on that app if you're interested in looking at some of our past messages. Finally, all of the notes and all of the C3 questions will be up on the website by the time this service goes live. So this morning, we are going to be continuing in our Malachi series and the passage for this morning is Malachi 2, 10 through 16. Uh, and so I'm going to read that this morning. Please uh, have a Bible in front of you as we go through this service. Um, we want you to see what's taking place from the Word of God and not simply accept the Word of the pastors. So please join me as I read this morning Malachi 2, 10 through 16. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? 
Why do we deal faithlessly with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? For Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the holy things which the Lord loves. For he has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, and yet brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, because he does not regard your offering anymore, nor will he receive it with pleasure from your hands. And yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? Because he seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal faithlessly with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and do not deal treacherously. Amen. Well, typically I would say it's good to see you, but I can't see you. So maybe I should say it's good that you see me. And I hope you're seeing me. And if you're hearing me, you're probably seeing me. So that's a good thing. But I, I will say this, I really miss you. I, I, miss, uh, I miss everybody being here. Um, I miss the fellowship. I miss your faces, most of your faces. And um, I, I'm glad that we at least have an opportunity to connect this way. So we are in Malachi this morning, chapter 2. And uh, as Clinton just read, we're going to be looking at those uh, verses 10 through 16. But before we start and step into God's word, let's pray. Lord, we know these are difficult times. They're, they're strange times, uh, weird times, Lord, frankly. They're just real hard to figure out. But we do cling to you, even as our time together this morning opened up and we were reminded of Romans 8, 28. God, that, that is a fortress, that, that you, the, the, the God who is sovereignly in control, can take all things, even, even the, the things we don't understand, even the things that are scary at times, and turn those into good. God, only you can do that. And so we come before you, the good God, this morning, and we open up your good word, and we pray that your spirit would teach us today, Lord. I pray for each one listening, watching uh, by way of, of the internet. And Lord, I, I pray that you would just help them this morning to be able to, to zero in, to concentrate, to hear what your spirit is saying to them. May, may Lord, may we in some way through this media be united. May we experience a connection today, Lord. But most of all, May we experience connection with you, and we'll thank you for it in your name. Amen. Well, if your family is, is anything like families that I'm a part of, on occasion you're involved in a family meeting. You, you guys are familiar with family meetings. Sometimes we, you know, we use uh, uh, specific terms like that, family meetings, sometimes they just come together and they're just a hooey, they just happen. But, but, but the families that I've been involved in, we have these periodic family meetings and the immediate family gets together and they discuss a situation. It could be a discussion about a plan for a future gathering. It could be uh, a gathering, a, a meeting together because uh, there needs to be an announcement made, like somebody in the family's pregnant. 
or it's an announcement about somebody's going to retire, decided they were going to retire. But, but, but usually it's to come together for some important reason. Many times a family meeting takes place because there's a topic that needs to be dealt with regarding a problem that the family's facing. Um, it's a situation that arises within the family that's important enough that it needs to be confronted. And, and these types of meetings and gatherings, they're not pleasant, but they're necessary. And, and hopefully, they're productive. In, in our ex exploration of the book of Malachi, we come to the, a kind of family meeting in this passage that we're looking at today. God, Daddy, has called this meeting, and it's not a pleasant one. It's not a family meeting to discuss where they're going to take their next family vacation or where to put Grandma when she starts getting older. It, it's a meeting of confrontation. The father of the family is confronting his children with an issue and it was a serious issue that could no longer go unchecked. It was an issue of unfaithfulness. Now, if you remember, when we started chapter 2 last week, God begins by addressing the priests. It's a confrontation, uh, it's a continuation of the address that he began back in chapter 1, where he said to, to the, the priest uh, that they were defiling his name. And that confrontation and, and uh, uh, presentation be, uh, continues in chapter 2 as chapter 2 begins. And the priests, if you remember, they're representatives of God. A priest was to represent the people to God and God to the people. And that's what we were looking specifically at last week as God talked to these leaders, these representatives, and he presented to them the problem that they were having. And that problem was that they weren't honoring his name. They had gone rogue. If you remember, they had gone off the path. In fact, that's the wording that's even used in that passage. These priests had gone off the path. And the thing about when a priest or a leader goes off the path, they normally end up taking the followers with them. And that's what God rebukes them on. You've gone off the path, you've gone rogue, and you're taking other people with you. But before, as we, as we look at what God says now to the people, to the followers, before he gets into the specifics, he, he reminds them again of this unique relationship that he has with them. Look at verse 10. He says, uh, through Malachi, are we not all children of the same father? Are we not all created by the same God? The we here is not everyone in the world. Malachi's not saying to everybody in the world, hey, uh, we all have the same father. This kind of universal idea that God is the father of everybody. No, no, no. Remember the context of what's going on here. The we that's being spoken of are the Israelites. These are the children of Israel. He's not just, this is not a general statement to everybody. He's talking specifically about the relationship he has with Israel. God had a fatherly relationship with the people of Israel. It was a unique relationship. Remember, the, the, the whole book starts off where God says, man, I have loved you, I have chosen you, right? These were his people. We see this fatherly figure in verse 6 of chapter 1 where he says, hey, if I'm your father, your master, where are the, where's the honor and respect I deserve? See, God had chosen Israel to be his special people and to be in this father-child type relationship. Isaiah 63, 16, the, the people say to God this, they say, surely you are still our father. Even if Abraham and Jacob would disown us, Lord, you would still be our father. You are our redeemer from past ages. See, Israel, they, they knew, they understood that this relationship was that of a father and a child. Hosea 11.1, 1, it says this, When Israel was a child, God says, I loved him and I called my son out of Egypt. Again, this father-child relationship. So 
my point being, we don't want to come to this passage and just assume that God is talking to everybody in the world and saying, hey, I'm your father. That's not the case. In fact, God had this special relationship with Israel and as we get into the New Testament, we discover that God has a special father relationship with those who trust Christ as Savior. So here's another thing. If we look at this passage, you might be tempted to go, wow, this is to Israel. It's really not to me. I'm not Jewish. But when we get to the New Testament, what we discover is everyone who becomes a follower of Jesus Christ becomes a child of God. L listen to what it says. John 1, 12 through 13 um, says this, but to all who believed him, talking about Jesus, and accepted him, listen, he gave the right to become children of God. Verse 13, they are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. The Bible talks about being born again. We're born into a spiritual family. God as our father, we as his children. Galatians 3.26 says this, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what gets you into the family. Not just because you're alive. Just because you're a person. Just because you're breathing air doesn't mean you're God's child. A person becomes God's child through birth, spiritual birth, through Jesus Christ. So, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you are God's child. You are a part of his forever family. Israel, they were God's children because he had chosen them as his special people. And so as Malachi approaches the people as prophet, he reminds them of this familial relationship that they have with God. And the problem with this relationship is that the people had become unfaithful. The, word, the Hebrew word for unfaithful shows up five times in this passage. It shows up in verse 10, verse 11, verse 14, 15 and 16. And, and in your translation, it might be a little bit different. It may say unfaithful in those uh, verses, but it may also have the word treacherous, same word. Or it may have uh, the word betray. And we'll see that in just a minute. The NLT in the very first reference there in verse 10 uses the word betray. But they all mean unfaithful. These family members were being confronted by the Father because of their unfaithfulness. Now, if you and I who trusted Christ as our Savior, if we are part of God's family, then we need to understand what it looks like to be unfaithful in that commitment, in that relationship. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at in this passage, is what it looks like to be an unfaithful family member. We're going to look at the transgression of the unfaithful family, the traits of an unfaithful family member, and then the treatment or the remedy for an unfaithful family member. So, if you got notes this morning, jump right in there on the first one, the transgression of the unfaithful family member. Uh, verse 10, it says, um, if you are my children... If, are we not all children of the same Father? Are we not all created by the same God? Then why do we betray each other? Literally, why are we unfaithful to each other? Look, violating the covenant of our ancestors. The, the transgression, the problem with these family members is that they were violating the covenant of their ancestors. And remember, we made brief reference to this last week. Covenant comes up all the time in Malachi's address. And, and just uh, so that we don't get uh, tangled up with all the details of a covenant, a covenant basically was a serious agreement between two parties. It, it was deeper than a promise. It, it, was, it was serious stuff. 
Uh, I, I remember one time as a kid, I, I don't remember who actually taught me this, but I remember one time uh, I was with a couple of guys and we were, I don't know, probably third, fourth grade, and we were playing some games and one of the guys decided that we needed to make a pact with each other. And so I was like, well, what's a pact? Well, a pact is that's where we make promises to each other that we're buddies and we're going to stick together. And I was like, oh, wow, that sounds cool. Yeah, I'll make a pact. And then he says, well, what we need to do is we need to become blood brothers. I was like, well, what's a, what's a blood brother? We got to cut ourselves and then we got to mix our blood together. Now, how's that sound like in the environment that we're in right now with all the COVID-19 stuff going on? But when I was a kid, that sounded kind of cool until they started talking about the cutting part, and I wasn't so sure I was crazy about that. But fortunately, we didn't have to cut ourselves too deep, but just enough to blood. And then, for whatever reason, it had to be the wrist, and fortunately, I didn't cut too deep because I'm still here today. But anyway, we cut our wrists a little bit so there was enough blood, and then we put our wrists together like this. And then the guy said, we're now blood brothers. So, and I don't even remember the guy's name, so how much of a blood brother? <laughs> Am I to this? But anyway, the, the, the point was we were, we, were, we were demonstrating that this was not just a promise. This was serious, man. We were mixing our blood together. We were mixing our pathogens together. We were, we were going to be pals for life. Well, a, a covenant was this serious agreement between two parties. It went deeper than a promise. And, and Israel was breaking this covenant. Their unfaithfulness boiled down to the idea that they were breaking, they were transgressing this covenant. And say, well, what did that all involve? Well, there was a lot of different things involved in the covenant that Israel had, but when you boil it all down, it came down to two basic ideas, right? This is real simple and basic, and the cool thing is it applies to you and me. The covenant that Israel had was, was two-part. Love God, love others. That was it. And if they would love God and love others. Now, there was a lot of detail that God gave on that. Of course, we go through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and, we see, and we're going to talk about a couple of those things in just a minute. But, but they were supposed to teach each other to love God and love others. And as long as they were doing that, they were keeping the covenant. They were keeping this serious uh, pact, this serious promise, this serious agreement between themselves and God. And, and, it, and it took form in various ways. They were supposed to treat each other special because they were a part of God's family. And you find things like in Levitic, Leviticus 25 that they were supposed to um, care for each other. If they fell into poverty, they were supposed to make sure that they took care of each other and they provided for each other. Uh, you go further down in that chapter, Leviticus 25, and it tells us that um, when, they, when they fell on hard times and they needed a loan, that they weren't supposed to charge each other interest. It was just a demonstration that they cared for each other. They were going to help each other. You go down a little bit further and you discover that um, if they needed food and you had food to sell to them, you weren't supposed to sell the food at a profit to your brother. Just, just different things like that. But the point of the matter is the covenant involved treating each other above and beyond how you would treat anybody else. And they were breaking this and they were being unfaithful to each other and they were the implication is cheating each other, doing each other wrong. That was the transgression that was taking place. And as we, as we pull this transgression apart, the passage gives us certain traits or characteristics of what was taking place. And that's what we'll take a look at right now, these traits of the unfaithful family. Here's number one. They, can, they became compromised in their relationships. Look what it says again in verse 10. They were betraying each other. They weren't treating each other the way God had commanded them to. And all of this can be traced back to chapter 1. Chapter 1 is when God confronts the priest and the basic confrontation had to do with the fact that they were dishonoring his name. Do you remember we looked at the fear of God. They stop valuing God's name. They stop putting weight behind the person of God. 
they lost their fear and awe of God. And as a result, what we're seeing is it began to affect their relationship with other people. Now, if you've got notes, would you put this down? How you treat others is a reflection of your relationship with God. Listen, we talked about this the other week. If I'm not right with God, I'm going to have a hard time being right with others. Oh, don't get me wrong. You'll get along fine with people that are like you. You'll get along fine with people who cater to you. It's the people that tend to rub you the wrong way. If your relationship's not right with God, you're not going to care about being right with them. You're going to grumble about them. You're going to complain about them. You're going to gossip about them. See, when your relationship is not right this way, it's not going to be right this way. We talked about this before. Married couples, look, if you're struggling in your relationship with your spouse, and we'll get to this in just a minute, but if you're struggling with your relationship with your spouse, guess what? It's primarily a relationship this way. Something is wrong in your relationship this way. And what Israel was being confronted here by God is, look, things aren't right in the family because things aren't right with daddy. And if you'll get things right with daddy, then things will be right with your brother. Listen, if, if we have a proper view and relationship with God, it's going to change the way we feel about people. Think back to our study of Imago Dei. If I see others as being little Imago Dei's, little images of God, created in the image of God, then my treatment of them is going to reflect that. And even more, if that, that person is a follower of Jesus, I'm going to even be that much more looking at them in a different way. Listen to how John says it in 1 John 4.20. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people, we can see. How can we love God who we can't see. John says, look, don't tell me how much you love God and then you have a problem with your brother, your, your fellow believer, a person in the family, because if you do, you're lying. I mean, I'm not saying that. John's saying that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But we, we walk around going, yeah, I love God, I love God. We're like, oh, who over here, who over here? And John's saying, stop, stop. Stop talking about how much you love God when you're struggling with all these relationships. That's basically, basically what Malachi is saying here. So how does this relate to the situation that we're in? Well, again, I, I want to encourage us. How are we loving folks during this time of crisis? See, see if we're not careful, the, the, the panic and the fear that can come with what's happening right now can cause us to not love each other. Let me give you an example. And, and I know I'm probably going to uh, maybe step on a few toes here, but that's okay, because I really think that this is part of the problem if we're not careful. We had our first uh, case of the virus this week on island. Hey, nobody wanted to see that. Uh, I was praying that it wouldn't happen that we would somehow, uh, that, you know, this thing would pass over and never touch Molokai. But it has. I've heard some pretty harsh things about this individual who was um, discovered that had the virus. You know what? Um, it sounds like, and again, I don't know the whole story, it sounds like some unwise decisions were made on this individual's part. But you know what? Right now, they're sick. And they need us to pray for them. Uh, not hate on them, um, you know, uh, confrontation and rebuke can come maybe sometime down the road, but that's not what this individual and their family needs right now. They need us to be praying for them and to continue to pray for each other. And we need to be reaching out to each other and touching each other and picking up a telephone and texting. And all these are definite ways that we can be loving others during this time of crisis. How are we doing as a family? How are we doing as children of God in this situation? Well, 
Here's number two. Not only were they um, compromised in their relationships, they were clouded in their discernment. They were clouded in their discernment. L look, in verse uh, 11, it says they were marrying women who worship idols. Down in verse 14, they were being unfaithful to their wives, to their spouses. Because their view of God was messed up, because they had stopped fearing God the way that they were supposed to, it began to mess with their moral discernment. They were making poor choices in their relationships. And the poor relational choices that were most prominent involved marriage. I mean, that's the, the foundational relational uh, 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 establishment in our society is marriage. And so, of course, God was going to go and point out in these marital relationships where things were going wrong. They were making discernment problems. They had discernment issues when it came to these mar marital relationships. And, and, and here's the deal. They were, they were marrying people they shouldn't have married in the first place. And they were divorcing people they shouldn't have divorced. I mean, that's the bottom line. They were stepping into relationships they never should have stepped into. And they were getting out of relationships they never should have got out of. And, and this passage is primarily about unfaithfulness in relationships due to their ultimate unfaithfulness to God. And, and I know that many, many people run to this passage as a passage on divorce. And it does talk about divorce, but it's not primarily about divorce. It's primarily about relationships. And of course, just like we said, one of the, one of the foundational uh, primary relationships in our world is marriage. And so that would be used in a passage that's dealing with family members that have become unfaithful in all of their relationships. You would expect it to talk about this foundational relationship of marriage. And there are some very pertinent lessons that we can take from this passage on the relationship of marriage, not just divorce, but marriage in general. And, and here's what I want you to do. If, if you've got your kids at home right now and they're not sitting in front of whatever device you're watching this on, would you please gather them together for the next five minutes? Because I'm going to give you just a couple of lessons from this passage your children need to know. Some of you should have known this before you ever got married and you certainly want to teach it to your children. And if you don't know these things, let me teach it to them. And then you can back it up when we're done here this morning. So grab them real quick. Yell at them right now. Hey, get in here. And get them in front of the computer or the phone or the iPad or whatever. And I want you to catch these things. And if you didn't download the notes this morning, please write these down. Because these are important for you to understand and to pass on because this is why we're in some of the mess that we're in today, not just in our society, but frankly, in our churches, all right? So here's the first one. Never marry an unbeliever. God rebukes these people for being unfaithful first in the relationship of marriage because they're marrying women that are worshiping idols, they don't believe in the one true God. Oh, notice, they're showing up at the temple. They're going to worship, but they have no desire to worship the one true God because they are daughters of idols. See, like the, the, the people of Israel were children of God. These individuals were children of daughters of idols. And God says, man, this shouldn't be happening. You go, oh, that sounds kind of harsh. Is that kind of, uh, isn't that kind of discrimination? Absolutely, it is discrimination. It's not, it's not ethnic dis discrimination. We're not talking about, God doesn't say here, oh, you guys, you went out and you married these, uh, these, uh, this other race over here. You shouldn't have been married. No mixing of the race. 
what you find in Scripture is God forbids his people to marry others who are not committed to him. That's what you find. It's not about what race they are. Hey, marry whoever, black, white, blue, pink, but make sure that they're a believer. Don't marry. Listen, I don't, I don't know how, how I can stress this anymore with your kids, man. Make sure that you're, t- I have seen so many situations that are heartbreaking because two people got married, one a believer and one not, and man, it just led to all kinds of trouble. Listen to what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. He says this, and, and, and by the way, before I read this, this passage isn't primarily about marriage. It, it's, it's about relation, uh, business relationships with a believer and an unbeliever. But it applies to marriage because we're talking about covenant here, right? Agreements here. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. He's talking to uh, the church of Corinth, followers of Christ. Don't team up with unbelievers. Your your scripture may say, uh, don't be unequally yoked. That's an old English way of saying it. And in the New Living Translation says, don't be teamed up with them. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we, us, Christians, followers of Christ, we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. What is he saying? If we are temples of God, what on earth are we doing hooking up with someone who has no relationship with God at all? And that's the foundational relational unfaithfulness that God addresses first with these folks. Listen, I could go, I could go uh, on a list of people that I've dealt with over the last 25 years where their, their marriages, their relationships have been a mess because they're not on the same page when it comes to God. One's a believer, one's not. You say, well, wait a minute. I mean, doesn't, isn't there any situation where one of the spouses that's not a believer, they get married and then eventually that person gets saved? Yep, probably, but I can't think of one that I've dealt with, honestly. So, never marry an unbeliever. Okay, it's about to get more controversial. You ready? Here's the next one. Hold on. Never marry just for love. Never marry just for love. And the key there is just. Yes, get married and love the person you're marrying. Please don't say, well, Randy said we could get married and not love each other. That's not what I'm saying. Never marry just for love, all right? So, well, what are you talking about? Bottom line, you can fall in love with about anybody. Theoretically. You spend enough time with someone, you get to know them, uh, and you click. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter at that, a certain level where their heart is as far as their relationship with God. You can love that person on this plane and they not be a believer. If you just base your desire to get married on falling in love with someone, you are setting yourself up for failure. Don't marry just for love. Right? Right? See, because what we've done with love is we've so perverted it, we'll do something like this. We'll tell, you know, somebody say, wow, I really, you know, they really want me to have sex with them, and I don't know if I should. And then the other person says, well, do you love them? So the implication is, as long as love's involved, sex before marriage is okay. And it's not, folks. And, and, and see, what we've done is we've made love the, the thing that makes everything okay. And the reality is that our love is never a pure love. That's one of the problems. But when it comes to these marital relationships, you can easily love a person that doesn't, doesn't love God. All right? Go back to that 2 Corinthians 6 passage that I just started reading to you a minute ago, starting at verse 14. Now look at verse 16. 
He continues, he says, What union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. And now he quotes from the Old Testament. I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There's promises there. And again, God's not saying, come out from among them, don't have anything to do with them. He's not saying, yo, stay away from unbelievers. Don't do. That's not what he's saying at all. In fact, what we know in, in Scripture is we're supposed to be reaching out and building relationships with unbelievers to get the gospel to them and love them. He's talking about these unequally uh, linked relationships, business partnerships, marriages. That's what he's talking about here, these deep covenant commitments. He's saying, man, don't do it. And, and here's the thing. Verse 1 of chapter 7 in 2 Corinthians is really a continuation of the thought. Listen to what it says. Why? Why should we do this? He says, well, look, because we have these promises. Well, what promises? The ones he just said. I'll be your father and you'll be my sons and daughters. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our spirit. What, again, he's talking about these, these teaming up with these unsaved people. Listen, let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. Do not marry just for love. Make sure that person fears and loves God. That's what this is saying. Make sure that they love God, that they are following Jesus. In fact, I would encourage you to look for somebody that loves God more than you do. Because maybe that will help you love him more too. But if you're looking for somebody who's a fixer-upper, and, and right now I'm primarily talking to girls, because for whatever reason, girls, you, you have this heart of compassion and love, and, and you see a guy and you go, well... I think he could be a really great guy. Maybe someday he'll really love God. He's a fixer-upper. Dump him like a hot potato, man, and look for a guy that loves Jesus. Okay? Don't, don't get caught up with a guy that needs a lot of work. Let God do the work away apart from you. And maybe God will fix him up for somebody else, but right now he's not for you. Don't marry just for love. Here's the one that deals with divorce. Number three, divorce should never be an option. Divorce should never be an option. You go, what do you mean by that? Well, verse 15 at the beginning, it says, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? This, this harkens back to Genesis chapter 2 where God brings Eve to Adam after he creates Eve and Adam goes, whoa, this one is now bone of my bone. and flesh. She came out of me. She's part of me. And then the, the verse says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and the two shall become one. And, and we see that reference here. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? There's supposed to be a unity, a oneness, right? And then verse 16 says, for, for I hate divorce, says the Lord. Now, I know a lot of people like to run to this and, and, and use this to bang people over the head that have been divorced, but here's the, the reality. In the context of what's going on here, these people are just divorcing either to marry these women that are idol worshipers or just to divorce. The, the, the context here is, is not such that we run to this and say that God hates every single divorce in that he never wants you to divorce. In fact, we know from the New Testament, we go to the New Testament passages like Matthew 19, Mark 10, where Jesus does say, hey, because of infidelity, because of sexual sin, and he ultimately says, because of the hardness of our heart, God has allowed divorce, but that's not his ideal. That's not what he chooses. That's not what he wants. It's only uh, permissible because sin has entered the picture. And when I say that it never should be an option, what I mean is when you step into a marriage, it never should be in the back of your head, well, if this doesn't work out, I'll just get a divorce. 
That's, that's the, the divorce option that looms back there. In fact, I'll go a step further. Whenever you get in a struggle as a, as a married couple in a fight, the D word should never come off your lips. Uh, Louise and I have been married 32 years, 32 glorious years. And I, <laughs> she's here, by the way. And, and I just got to tell you, never have we talked about divorce. It's never been brought up as a potential. It's never been brought up as a, uh, you know, what, what if it came to that point someday? It's never discussed. Because it was always from day one, never an option. So don't step into a relationship thinking, well, if this doesn't work, then, then we'll just, you know, go our separate ways. Let me remind you of something, and it's implied here in this passage. Uh, in the New Living Translation, it says, to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, um, in the New King James Version, it says, for it covers one's garments with violence. You go, what does all that mean? Basically, it means this. Divorce, would you put this down? Always hurts. It always hurts. I don't care if it was the worst marriage in the world and you guys fought all the time. When you separate, when that divorce finally takes place, there's always a sense of loss, hurt, and pain for the people involved. And certainly, if there's children involved, that's true. Divorce always hurts. It's not God's best. Yes, sometimes because of sin, it is permitted. And so some of you are listening to this, go, wow, am I a bad guy? Am I under God's judgment? You know, I, I say no to that, not knowing all your specific details, but I, I will say this, there are circumstances where unfortunately divorce is, is something that that has to take place, but it's not God's ideal. Never step into a marital relationship with that as an option. Well, we got to move on. Here's number three. The third trait of an unfaithful family member is this. They had become confused in their worship. Verse 13 says this. Here's another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with your tears. You weep and you groan because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why does the Lord accept my worship? They're living out this unfaithfulness in their relationship toward others and, and it's showing up in their marriages. And then they're showing up for worship. And they're wondering why the experience isn't turning out the way that they thought it was, should turn out. They're bringing sacrifices, they're displaying great emotion, and God doesn't seem to be impressed, and they're confused. Man, what's going on? Why, why, why isn't God uh, hearing me? Why isn't he accepting my sacrifice? There was open sin going on in their lives with their brothers, with their sisters, in their marriages, and then they show up and they, they wonder why worship isn't the experience they had anticipated. Folks... There is so much lessons for us to learn in this situation. I mean, if we're not dealing with each other the way that we're supposed to, first and foremost in our marriage relationships, but then in our relationship with each other, and we come to the house of God and we try to worship, and we wonder why we're not stirred and why it seems like our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. And, and, and man, I'm, I'm trying, I'm crying, I'm, I'm, I'm raising my hands, I'm singing louder, but it just doesn't seem to be doing anything. You're in the same boat that these guys were in, confused about what worship is about, confused at how to do it. Let me real quick give you some signs that maybe your, your worship has become confused. Here's the first one. You come to worship because of what you get out of it. Well, that right there is, you're setting yourself up, up for a confused worship experience. If you're just kind of, oh, I wonder what they're going to do today. I wonder if his message is going to be good today. I wonder if they're going to sing the songs I like today. And if you walk out at the end of worship more times than not thinking, well, I didn't really get much out of that. Well, then you probably started off the wrong way. It's not about what you get, primarily. It's important that you do get something out of worship, and I, I don't want to take that away, but that shouldn't be your primary goal. Listen to Psalm 29.2. Honor the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in splendor of his holiness. Man, when we come to worship 
It should be about, about him. God, I want to come and I want to worship you with other followers of you, brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to, I want to just lay out before you. You know, I am so looking forward to the first time that we can get back together again after this whole thing is over. Because I think we are going to have an amazing time of fellowship and worship. But that's what it should be every week that we come. Anticipating worshiping our God. Not, not what am I going to get out of this thing, right? I, I could park there for a while, but we've got to go quick. The next one is this. You think that your presence at worship should impress God. Just because you show up. God, you should be impressed. I'm here. Like you're doing God some kind of favor. And man, if that's the case, you're confused in your worship. These people were showing up. They were coming to the temple. They were even bringing sacrifices. We found out from the previous chapter that it were, they were lame sacrifices, but they were, they were at least trying some kind of worship experience, expecting that God was going to be impressed with it. God is not impressed when we show up to worship him because it's not about us. Here's the next one. You believe that your emotional response in worship should move God. Hey, look what these guys are doing. Verse 13, they're crying, weeping over the altar. Oh, God, we're here. Oh, God, accept our offering. Man, listen, let me tell you something. You can stand and raise your hands and boo-hoo cry and fall on the floor and the song moves you. God's not impressed with that, necessarily. If your heart is not in the right place, if you're not, if you're, you're not right with God and right with your brothers, somehow you think that some kind of an emotional response in worship is going to go, wow, the, look, at they must really love me. Look at how much tears they're crying. Oh, look at them. They must really love. God's not impressed. God's not impressed. Here's, here's the last one. You think that the way you live during the week should have nothing to do with how you worship on Sunday. Hmm. Hey, you know what? What I do during the week is what I do during the week. What I do on Sunday is what I do on Sunday. They, they, don't, need the, they don't need the me, right? <laughs> Wrong. Worship is not primarily what you do in a building on a Sunday morning. It's how you live your life. If you're walking through your week living any kind and then you come into God's house and you expect that there's supposed to be some kind of magical difference, you're confused in your worship as much as these folks were confused back then. They were unfaithful to their God. Psalm 51, 17 says this, The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and a repentant heart, O oh God. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for our spirit to be broken and contrite before him and say, God, I need you and I just want to love you today. And, and God, you're all that. You're all that and more. These folks were being found unfaithful and in the process they were confused in their worship. So, so what's the treatment? What's the remedy for these unfaithful uh, family members well, it's right here in verse 15 and 16. It's, it's, it's mentioned twice. Maybe you saw it in the New Living Translation. He says, so guard your heart. Again in verse 16, so guard your heart and don't be unfaithful. There's the, there's the treatment. There's the remedy. Guard your heart. The word literally there for heart is the word, same word many times translated, spirit. Guard the thing that makes you, you. In other words, the implication is, look, this is not something that just happens. You let down your guard and you began to drift in your relationship with God. And so it's affected your relationship with others. Now get back and check up on your heart. Proverbs 4, 23 says this. Guard your heart above all else, above everything else. For it determines the course of your life. Somebody says, what? Check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? What does that mean? Well, it's actually kind of biblical. Because that's exactly what he's talking about here. Step back. Take a look about, at what you're about to do. Because it's going to have potentially some dangerous side effects. Step back, 
Check your heart. See if it's aligned with God. See if you're loving and fearing God the way that you need to. Because if it's not, it's going to start affecting all these relationships out here. And certainly the ones closest to you. These folks were unfaithful family members. They, they were in a situation where they found themselves compromising the relationships around them. Instead of, instead of building on that, that family tie, the covenant, they found themselves moving in a situation where they were, they were falling farther apart instead of closer together. They became clouded as a result in their discernment. They no longer were able to discern moral things like they should have. They were going around and making relationships with people they shouldn't have been making relationships. And they were breaking relationships with people they never should have been breaking relationships with. And it continued on and it spilled out until they got to the point where they were confused in their worship of God. Folks, this, this, is, this is a rebuke to these family members in Malachi's day, and I believe that it very well could be a rebuke to God's family members today. You know, in the time that we find ourselves in right now, where we've got maybe most of us a little bit more time than we've had, I want to encourage you, use that time wisely. Check yourself. Guard your heart. See where you're at as a family member of the Most High God. And can I say this? I don't know who's watching or listening to this right now, but if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you're outside of God's family. This word isn't for you specifically, but it could be. If if you would place your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, You can have your sin forgiven. The Bible says you're born into God's family. He becomes your father. You become his child. There's a whole brand new relationship waiting for you. Father, I thank you for your amazing love. I thank you that you're a God that doesn't just go off the handle and and lower the boom with all of us scratching our heads, wondering what went on. You warn and you rebuke and you woo us to yourself because you're a God of love and a God of justice and a God of mercy. Oh God, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ, God, that we would be together the family of faithful members that we should be faithful to you, faithful to each other. Lord, I pray during this time of this health crisis that we find ourselves in, Lord, that our hearts would turn to you, that we would be seeking your face more than ever, that we would be looking for opportunities to reach out and love to those around us. May we, may we not, Lord, find ourselves cowering in fear and focusing just on us. May we look for opportunities to be Jesus to those around us. Thank you for your amazing love. In your name, amen. Hey, I want to invite you to invite your friends this week to join us for Easter online. I know it's kind of funny. It's, it's kind of weird. Uh, you know, we're normally passing out cards for people to come to Easter in the park. And we can't do that this year. But we can invite them to come online for a service. And I promise you, I will do my very best to make the gospel message as clear as I can. Because I believe that God wants to use the time that we're in right now and use Easter Sunday to bring lots of people to himself. And so please, bring... Uh, Bring as many folks with you online next week as you can.